Okay, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to this event, which has been sponsored by the European Health Board and the Mental Health Foundation and the Scottish Mental Health Research Network, uh, of which I am chair. So I'm Stephen Laurie, I'm the head of psychiatry at the University of Edinburgh, and I am going to chair this evening's event. Uh, we're very lucky to have Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson with us, uh, and they're going to be talking shortly for around about 50 minutes, and then we will have around about 40 minutes Q&A session. Uh, but before we get started with their talk about this very important topic and their updated book, I'm pleased to be able to introduce Alison McCullum, who's the Director of Public Health in Lothian, and she's going to set the scene, uh, and then I'll come back and introduce the speakers. I would uh, like to say to you all that we are recording the proceedings this evening, so uh, we are, the camera is aimed at the slides and will only be visual at the slides and the speakers. But if you ask a question, it will be recorded. So <coughs> please bear that in mind. Alison, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here to um, launch the uh, inner level in Edinburgh um, and to have Richard and Kate with us um, to talk to us about the book. Um, Edinburgh is a city of nooks and crannies, heights and depths, sparkling cityscapes and an underbelly. It's been a city of great inequality for centuries, as are proud monuments to those who benefited from the riches of slavery can testify. A city that has had to hard, learn hard lessons as it pursued for a number of years economic happiness above everything else. It is a city, however, of where we are readers, writers, curators of written, spoken, and sung words, and a place where readers are found everywhere. This book will be on our city institutions recommended <coughs> reading list, and having read most of it, not all of it, but most of it, we will all benefit from the lessons in it. It's a city of practical help and quiet kindness, and a city where, if we all work together to be the person who has someone else's back, a city where we, together, take the tiny steps that will help us achieve the vision in the book then I will be very pleased to be made redundant because you won't need a director of public health to speak out from time to time. So as we, work, as we learn about the book, as we learn from the lessons of the research worldwide, let's think about what the next steps will be to start to deliver that vision and to listen to these inspiring speakers tonight. Thank you. So thank you very much, Alison. Uh, I suspect that Kate and Richard need a very little introduction to this audience, but it's a great pleasure and a privilege for us to be able to see them uh, live and talk to us about these very important issues. You will no doubt be aware that their book, The Spirit Level, came out 10 years ago uh, to great acclaim. Uh, not universal acclaim, and uh, that might be an interesting topic for discussion later on, but great acclaim and general acclaim uh, for pointing out the important associations between in income inequalities and a whole wide ar array of, of social ills. Uh, their most recent book, The Inner Level, takes that a step further, uh, at least from my perspective as a psychiatrist, uh, <laughs> and boils it, boils it down to how those issues, how those inequalities might impact on individuals and communities and societies. And I think that takes us a step nearer being able to address these issues. And uh, I would imagine those will be topics that will come up during the talks uh, and in the Q&A session later on. So, Kate and Richard are both professors of socioeconomic It's a delight to have you here. Kate is going to talk first, followed by Richard, and then we'll have uh, a lot of time for Q&A afterwards. Kate, thank you. Thanks. 
Thank you very much for those introductions. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. We were in Glasgow last night. It's great to be in Edinburgh tonight. Tomorrow we've got to go to South Korea. We've got no idea what that will be like, um, but I hope they're as friendly as um, our audiences always are in Scotland. So I'm going to um, do the first half of our talk, and then Richard will take over, and then we hope to have plenty of time for questions and answers and discussions with you. And then afterwards, out there, they're selling our book. But I did notice that there's a book swap book club over by the toilets. So you can probably get something better um, <laughs> after you've had a glance through. Um, so, yeah, we're epidemiologists, which is quite a clumsy word. If you look at um, the front of our new book, Pigeon and a Peacock, and the front of our old book, which is called in Goldfish, you might think we're biologists, but we're not. We're epidemiologists, and that means we study the distribution and the determinants of health and illness in populations. So whereas doctors study those things in individuals and tell you why you might be sick and, and what's wrong with you, we look at whole populations and groups of people. Um, and we're here today to talk about our new book, but it very much builds on our previous book, which was called The Spirit Level, was published in 2009. So there are the goldfish. Um, and what that book showed, in a nutshell, was that income inequality, the gap between rich and poor in different societies, is linked to a very wide range of health and social problems. So the bigger the differences between those at the top and those at the bottom, in terms of their incomes, the more health and social problems societies have. And it also shows that those effects are really large, not just little differences between different countries and between different US states, but very large differences. And I think the thing that perhaps surprised people the most was we were also able to show that it isn't just the poor who were affected by inequality. When the divisions between rich and poor get larger, we all suffer, we're all affected by that change. I'll show you one or two charts from the spirit level just to get us in the mood for the inner level soon, because we all like a bit of data and statistics, don't we? Um, but also, in a nutshell, um, what the inner level goes on to show is how inequality strengthens the grip of class and status on us all. So it's much more about those pathways from which inequality causes all the health and social problems we know about. How does it get under the skin, into our minds, affect our feelings, our behaviours, our physiology, etc.? We also spend time in the book, and we're not going to talk about this this evening because we, we don't have time to cover everything, but we also cover um, a couple of the myths that people tend to use to try and justify inequality in society. And one of those is that it simply reflects a meritocracy. The clever and the capable move up, the stupid and the lazy move down. Um, and we show that that's not true, and that in fact, people's capabilities are shaped by their position in society and by inequality, rather than it being the other way around. And we also spend some time busting the idea that we can't do anything about inequality because it, humans are, by their very nature, individualistic, <coughs> aggressive, elbows out, competitive, so we can't tackle inequality because it's just part of human nature. And we show that that's not true, that we are just as good at being reciprocal, sharing, cooperative, looking out for one another, um, egalitarians. We're just as good at that kind of strategy. And we also spend time, which we'll talk about this a little bit tonight in our talk and probably a lot more in discussion with you about what we can do about inequality. But most of what we're going to talk about this evening is this first bullet point about how inequality um, affects us individually and primarily psychologically. So I mentioned data and statistics. That's what we do. Epidemiologists use data and statistics, equations and charts and models and that kind of thing, to compare 
population groups. But we realized very early on, more than 10 years ago, when we were writing the spirit level, that most people don't like data and statistics. A few people do, but most people don't. And if you put data and statistics into a book, people don't read it and they sort of turn away from it. So we did try always to make all of our data very accessible, keep things, keep things very simple, <coughs> keep things sort of legible and clear. But then we found this chart on Google Images, and we love it because it's job done, really. <laughs> so that's what the spirit level shows. When income inequality increases, all kinds of problems get worse. And if you can understand that chart, you can understand everything else we're going to talk about tonight. I now show a completely different one, don't I? But never mind. What we're looking at, what we're concerned with, is the gap between rich and poor. And the measure that we tend to use in our own research, lots of other people do as well, is the difference between the incomes of the top fifth of the population and the bottom fifth. So how much richer are the top 20% in any population compared to the bottom 20%? There are lots of other measures of inequality. It doesn't really matter which you use. You get, you get the same results. But this one's quite easy to understand. So if we look at the most equal rich developed countries, we've got Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden at the most equal end here. The top fifth of the population have incomes that are around three and a half to four times those of the bottom fifth. And in the more unequal countries, here we've got Australia, UK, Portugal, USA and Singapore, the top 20% have incomes that are seven to almost ten times those of the bottom fifth of the population. And we've got rich developed countries with varying degrees of inequality on that measure, all the way from the most equal to these more unequal ones. <clears throat> there are, of course, lots of countries around the world that are vastly more unequal than the rich developed nations. Richard will um, go through a little about what happens when countries get a lot more unequal, but our focus is on these rich market democracies. And in our spirit level book, what we did was gather evidence on health and social problems where we could find really good data that you could compare between different countries. They're really reliable sources of data. Problems that have got social gradients, so they're more common at the bottom of society, at the bottom of the social ladder, than they are at the top. And we gathered data on a range of different um, outcomes. Some of them are things to do with population health, so the average life expectancy, the infant mortality rate, levels of obesity, and levels of mental illness. But we also gathered information on things to do with children's life chances, so how well kids are doing on educational tests at age 15, whether there's a high teenage birth rate, levels of social mobility. And also measures that are to do with social cohesion, what relationships are like within a society. So we've got trust and violence and imprisonment. And when we put all of these measures together into an index, the countries at the top here are scoring worse on that index of health and social problems, and the countries at the bottom are scoring better. And we're relating them to that measure of income inequality that I just showed you in the last slide. It's a strong, significant relationship. If you know a country's level of inequality, you can predict really well its level of health and social problems. Now, um, Steve mentioned at the beginning that not everybody was, was thrilled by our evidence um, and, and our approach. And we knew that one thing that, that critics might suggest is that we, we chose those problems just to suit our, our argument. So we did it all again with somebody else's index of well-being, and we chose the UNICEF index of child well-being in rich countries, which was first published in 2007. In the 2007 report, some of you might remember it, the UK came rock 
bottom for child well-being in rich countries. These are data from a slightly later report, the 2015 report, where we're doing a wee bit better, but pretty much what you'd expect given our level of inequality. But the point about the UNICEF index is it contains lots and lots of different measures. So it's got everything from whether children get on with their peers to whether or not they've been immunized, eat their fruits and vegetables, have books at home, etc., etc. It's got 40 different components. And even more importantly, we didn't choose them. So somebody else has selected what they think are the best measures of child well-being. And it turns out that they're closely correlated with the level of inequality in a society. So Norway, Sweden, Netherlands up there with very high levels of child well-being, UK, Portugal, USA, Greece at the bottom. And we've seen this consistently over the years with UNICEF reports. There's a new one coming out on educational inequalities on the 30th of October. So look out for that in the news, see how the UK does. I'm not allowed to tell you, <laughs> but it's not very good. Um, <laughs> And the other thing we were sort of concerned about was that people might think it's not inequality that matters here, it's the cultural differences between those different societies. There's something odd about those Scandinavian countries. Or there's something peculiarly nasty about the English-speaking countries. It might be true. But we did everything again, looking at the American states, and we find exactly the same patterns more health and social problems in more unequal US states. There are 50 US states and we can compare their levels of inequality and problems. So all of this helped to convince us that what we were seeing was a causal relationship. And we have, since this book came out, we have published a causal analysis of income inequality and health. Um, and also, since the book came out, the evidence base, you know, the number of studies of inequality in relation to different kinds of problems, it's really grown. So it's both broadened and, and deepened. It's a really, really strong literature now. But in a way, the jumping off point for our new book was this chart. And this one shows levels of mental illness in different countries. Um, in relation to income inequality. <coughs> Excuse me. And what we're looking at here are data from the World Health Organization and similar surveys where what they do is try to figure out what percentage of the population have got some kind of mental illness. This is in the past year, in the past 12 months. And they don't do it by asking people whether they've been treated for a mental illness or whether they've seen a doctor and been diagnosed, etc., because that might well vary with health systems and culture. Instead, they take random samples of the adult population and they ask them questions about symptoms and feelings and that kind of thing. And then those can all be clustered together to decide who has had some kind of mental illness in the past year. And in the more equal societies, it's around 10%, of adults, and in the UK and Australia, 23%, and in the USA, more than one in four adults, 26%. And when we first published this, we were challenged by a psychiatrist as to whether these numbers were plausible. You know, did we really believe that 23% of adults in the UK had some kind of mental illness in the past year? To which our first sort of reaction is, yes, we do actually. Um, maybe we're peculiar, but just thinking about our own histories, family, friends, colleagues, people we know, 23% doesn't seem that far off. But anyway, the question is a red herring. The question isn't, is 23% the right number? Should it be 26%? Should it be 18%? The question is, why is the UK doing so much worse than all of these other countries? Why is the USA doing even worse than we are? What can explain these variations and these differences? And whether or not you want to label symptoms of distress, loneliness, loss of appetite, 
feelings of despair, suicide, self-harming, whether or not you want to label them as particular kinds of illnesses and give them particular kinds of labels and categories, it doesn't really matter. What these surveys are measuring is distress. It is suffering, and on a very vast scale in our unequal societies. So, I think what we're trying to do in the inner level is try and understand why there is such a huge gap I think, between how we think our societies ought to be and how we think we ought to feel and be and what they're really like. Because we're the fifth largest economy in the world. You know, if you asked our grandparents what would life be like at our levels of societal affluence, everybody would think that we'd be like the people in the top picture, happy, fulfilled, friendly, um, full of joy. That's actually people in an ad for a therapy centre. <laughs> <laughs> Post-treatment, pre-treatment, who knows, but they're putting on a good face. But the, the, this is a picture from real life. So these are young people, um, Oxford Street tube station, going to work in the morning or coming home, not quite sure which. Um, miserable, isolated, unhappy, angry, not talking to one another. And so in a sense, what we're trying to do is understand why does our society look and feel so much more like this than that top picture? And what is it that inequality seems to do to us that means that we are experiencing this epidemic of suffering and distress? And the Mental Health Foundation survey, which came out this year, I think really stressed the level of the problem for us. They reported that three quarters of us, 74% of adults felt so stressed that they were overwhelmed or felt unable to cope in the last year. That about a third of adults had had suicidal feelings because of stress, and about 16% had self-harmed. And you can see that the figures are much, much higher for our young people. And a more recent study looking at self-harm in young people found a shockingly high level for girls. So our young women are really suffering high levels of stress and self-harm. And this is the most complicated picture we're going to show you tonight, okay? When, when we first had that graph I just showed you about mental illness, more mental illness and more unequal societies, we guessed, academics call it theorised, but it basically guessed it. We guessed that what was going on was that when the differences between rich and poor get bigger, and social distances between us get larger, status becomes more important, money becomes more important, and so we worry about our status more. And so we felt that it would be anxieties about status that would be underpinning that relationship between inequality and mental illness. But we didn't have any data that showed that. We just had some experiments with monkeys and people and some biological bits of data, so we were guessing. But now colleagues in Ireland have shown that this is true. And what we're looking at here are levels of status anxiety. So higher anxieties, higher up, less anxiety, lower down, in three groups of countries. And the top line are highly unequal countries in Europe, the bottom line are the low inequality, the most equal countries in Europe, and there's a middle one. And the data are arranged from richest to poorest. So the poorest tenth of the population in all those countries is over there on the left-hand side, and the richest people are over here. So whether you're in an unequal country in the top bar or a very equal one in the bottom bar, you're more likely to worry about your status if you're poorer. That makes sense, yeah? Less likely to worry if you're richer. <coughs> but if you live in a more unequal country, everybody is more worried about their status, rich as well as poor. So we see these anxieties about status heightened 
for the whole population, from very poorest to very richest. And we then also, as well as those great data, which really, I think, helped us feel we were on the right track, came across the work of someone with an even more complicated sort of job title than epidemiologist, neurophysiology, a group of neurophysiologists from the University of California. And they were interested in mental illness, the causes of mental illness. And they were interested in something called the dominance subordination system, no, the dominance behavioral system. And the dominance behavioral system is, is the way in which our brains and our hormones and our nervous systems enable us to act when we are confronted by situations that are to do with superiority and inferiority. So think of all your daily Attenborough animal things, you know, you see two animals get together and one is stronger and one is weaker and they figure out who is stronger and the stronger one wins and gets more food and a better nest inside and sex and all those kinds of good things. We have that system still. So when we are in social situations, we respond to whether or not the people we encounter seem to us to be superior to us or inferior to us. And we tend to have strategies for dealing with those social differences. So some of us tend to be submissive and subordinate when we encounter difficult issues to do with status. We become depressed, we worry that we're not worth much, we withdraw from the encounter. And we see that actually we get more depression in more unequal societies. So more of that kind of submissive, anxious, depressed response in more unequal societies where there are more worries about status. But some people attempt to overcome those feelings of um, anxiety about status by doing the opposite, by doing what we might all call bigging themselves up, yeah? Um, thinking that they're more important than perhaps they are. Um, does that remind you of anybody? Um, so we see higher levels of what psychologists call self-enhancement in more unequal societies. More people willing to say that they're better than average. They're smarter, um, they drive better, they're better looking, they're nicer people. People are more likely to have that response in more unequal societies. And so you won't be surprised to see that over time, this is data from the United States, over time, 1975 to 2005, as income inequality, the top line rose, so did levels of narcissism. And we often say these days that, well, you can tell lots of funny stories about narcissism because narcissists do quite funny things. So you can hire paparazzi to follow you around and pretend that you're a celebrity, you're a narcissist, <laughs> that kind of thing. But in reality, narcissists, of course, cause their friends, their families, their colleagues great distress. And we do worry about what might happen if a narcissist were to rise to a position of great political power. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't that funny, though, is it? Um, and, and this graph, and I, is this where I am now? This graph shows that the swing towards Trump from Democrats to Republicans in the last election was best predicted <coughs> by an index of health inequality. So actually, when a society becomes very divided, very fractured, big differences between those who have everything and those left behind, um, there are worrying implications for our democracy and our well-being. Just before I hand over to Richard, there is another way in which we do respond to anxieties about status and how, how we feel other people judge us. So some of us get depressed and anxious, some of us get narcissistic and, or psychotic even, but some of us just consume more to show people that we are of high status, that we have high class goods so we're not second class people. Some of us drink more, some of us do more drugs, some of us eat more, some of us gamble more, but more of us shop more. Um, 
And if you can't afford really high class status goods, you could buy yourself a designer rubbish bag to put your, put your rubbish outside. This is a Louis Vuitton trash bag. <laughs> And if you can't even afford that, you can go on eBay and you can buy other people's used designer handbags to put your cheaper goods in um, and mask your status. But we have studies now showing that if you live in a more unequal society, you're more likely to buy status goods. So we see more consumerism, more status consumption, major barrier to the transition to sustainable economies, and also... Um, I'll skip that one, a driver of increasing debt. Again, debt, part of that cycle of mental distress um, that is so prevalent in our society today. So that's a sort of run through of lots of the data. I don't think Richard's going to show you any charts, maybe. One or two. Um, but he's, he's going to take over now and talk a bit more about how all this works, how it makes us all feel. Got those? Right, yes. <clears throat> I think basically we think about, most people think about inequality in a very naive way. They think inequality only matters if it creates uh, absolute poverty or something. Um, but what we really have to understand that inequality is in a sense a social relationship. <clears throat> It divides us more between superior and inferior, dominance and subordination, as Kate's been saying. Uh, and th this goes right into our feelings of self-worth. You know, that status anxiety graph she, she showed you, uh, I think we need to see how we not only judge each other more by status in more unequal societies, this idea that some people are so much worth so much more than others, but we also feel judged more by others. And I think how how much uh, how far this gets into um, our sense of ourselves. Uh, I have unfortunately not pulled out the piece of paper um, in time, um, but. <clears throat> I suspect that the uh, sort of social anxieties people feel, uh, you know, the awkwardness about social engagement, your feelings uh, that, you know, maybe social contact seems rather an ordeal. You have to worry about self-presentation and so on. It's, it's fairly mild with most of us, but we're worried about whether people think we're unattractive or stupid or all these kinds of things. All these things to do with self-worth. Um, but at an extreme level, if I can read this, we found a, a few quotes on the web, a society, a, a, a website called the Experience Project, where people uh, share their experiences of different social difficulties. I'll just read you four short quotes. In social situations, I shut down and I tend to be awkward because I'm scared of people judging me and not liking me so much that I distance myself. I hear people laughing, and I immediately think they're laughing at me, which is stupid, but I can't help it. Over the years, I've learned to embrace the loner lifestyle. Someone else says, sometimes I avoid anyone and everyone because I can't stand the thought of them judging me. I ha I'll have panic attacks over something as simple as going to the checkout at Walmart. I do self-checkout so I don't have to talk to anyone. And the last of these quotes, I'm extremely shy around both people I know and don't know. No, it hinders my everyday life so much that people think I'm making it up. I have no friends. It's hard to be, uh, for me to go anywhere. I always make sure I go shopping in the day. That way I can wear sunglasses or a hat. It's my security blanket from social anxiety disorder. I get tongue-tied and sweaty. Then I feel like they're looking at, at me and I'm as if I'm some kind of freak. It's a living hell. I struggle with it on a daily basis. So I suspect that we're dealing with levels of uh, anxiety about self-worth that go right down to that level. 
uh, and which play the divisive role that people have always suspected that inequality plays. And since uh, the French Revolution or, or beforehand, people have seen inequality as, as socially divisive at an intuitive level. The difference now is that we can compare in, uh, uh, societies uh, with statistics and so on. I don't think we're doing, dealing with something uh, when we talk about inequality, income inequality, uh, that's different from class and status. Well, I think we're really talking about whether we're dealing with a society that has a very steep social pyramid like that or a much shallower one. And as Kate said, all the problems that are more common in more unequal societies are the problems with those social gradients. You know, so there's ill health and violence and so on at the top of society. They're all more common at the bottom. You know, you all know what parts of Edinburgh kids do worst at school and where health is worst, life expectancy lowest. Uh, it's those kinds of problems, more common at the bottom, which get worse when we increase inequality. And so, in a sense, the relationship is extraordinarily simple. We're saying that problems which we know are related to social status within our societies get worse when we increase the status differences between us. And as Kate said, the only surprise is that it's not just worse for the people at the bottom. Inequality affects all of us. It makes the biggest difference to the people at the bottom, but even people with reasonably good jobs, incomes, education, and so on, if they were in a more equal society, they'd probably live a little bit longer. Their children would do a bit better at school. They'd be less likely to become victims of violence. In that way, we all do better in a more equal society. But as I say, it makes the biggest difference to the people at the bottom. But we're all part of this picture. Just as, as Kate showed in that uh, graph of uh, status anxiety, everyone is affected. Or if you look at graphs of health inequalities, it's not just a difference between the poor and the rest of society. It's a gradient that goes all the way across. Um, researchers in, on health inequalities, people like Michael Mann, say you can get rid of all the po problem of poverty and poor health, and you've got most of the pattern of health inequalities left. You have to have a theory which explains why people pretty far up the scale have higher death rates than people further up the scale. And it, it really is a pattern that involves all of us. Um, so think of this as something specific to do with problems that have these social gradients. And most of the problems which we looked at in the spirit level are in a sense behavioral. You know, we were showing that there's more violence measured by homicide rates, the more teenage births, there's more drug abuse. All those kinds of problems are, in a sense, behavioral. People are behaving differently in more unequal societies. So we know that, they, that in some way, inequality gets into our heads, makes us behave differently. And our, our more recent book, The Inner Level, is really about the psychological effects of inequality, how it gets into our heads. I want to get rid of the idea that we're dealing with an effect of different material standards affecting us directly. And I think economists have brainwashed us all into thinking that uh, what matters most is our material living standards in themselves. And so, you know, people start off thinking health inequalities are simply about uh, quality of uh, housing and diet and so on. But what is also extremely important is where your level of living places you in relation to others in society. It's, if you like, a marker of, of where you come in the status hierarchy. And one of the examples which really shows the importance of social position comes from a study of poverty in different societies. Um, <clears throat> a paper in a journal called the Journal of Social Policy, uh, which is based on interviews with people in poverty in very different countries. So they interviewed people in poverty in Uganda, India, China, Pakistan, Korea, United Kingdom, and Norway. And 
What is so remarkable is, of course, poverty means quite different things in most societies. And in India, it means living in maybe in a situation as bad as that. In Norway, it means uh, living in perhaps a three-bedroom centrally heated flat with lots of electronic goods and so on. And yet the experience of poverty, despite those very different material um, uh, conditions, uh, was extraordinarily similar. So the paper says, respondents universally despised poverty and frequently despised themselves for being poor. Parents were often despised by their children, women despised their menfolk, and some men were reported to take out their self-loathing on their partners and children. Despite generally believing that they had done their best against all odds, they mostly considered that they had both failed themselves by being poor and that others saw them as failures. This internalization of shame was further externally reinforced in the family, the workplace, and in their dealings with officials. Even children couldn't escape this shaming. No parent was, uh, sorry, uh, uh, go straight to the end. For men, relying on others or on welfare benefits was perceived as a challenge to their sense of masculinity. The British father of two, uh, cho two children admitted, I feel like shit. I'm the man in this relationship. I'm meant to be the man to take care of the missus and my kids, and I don't. So see this as about uh, a sensitivity to social status, to low social status, uh, to feeling looked down on. And of course, that's not just the poor. In a sense, we all feel inferior to the people above us in society. Social exclusion isn't something just at the bottom. You know, the people in the big house in our village wouldn't think of inviting us to, the, to, to dinner with them. And we'd probably feel pretty awkward about inviting them to back to dinner if they did. Uh, you know, the, this social exclusion goes all the way up, and these feelings of superiority and inferiority um, go all the way uh, from top to bottom. So that's we're dealing, as I say, with that evolved sensitivity to social status, and you can see it in things like the relationship between violence and inequality. You know, violence is triggered so often by feeling people feeling disrespected, humiliated, and so on. And, and how it involves health and increased death rates is because, of course, we're extremely sensitive to stress. Um, and our worries about how we're seen and judged uh, are probably about the most widespread stressor in society. You know, the worst stresses, losing your job, being sent to prison or losing your house, but only a small proportion suffer things like that. We all know these sort of self-doubts. Um, maybe I'm boring, I'm attractive, uh, people think I'm stupid, all those sorts of uh, issues. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's been shown in psychological experiments that we are extremely sensitive to those kinds of um, uh, stresses. Kate mentioned bullying um, or, or the monkey dominance hierarchies. So, you know, the one at the top is the strongest and the one at the bottom is the weakest. And in a sense, the animal dominance hierarchies are bullying hierarchies. I'd love to have data on uh, internationally comparable data on bullying amongst adults. We don't have that. Uh, but there are now a number of studies which show that bullying amongst children, where you can compare different nations, is much more common uh, in more unequal societies. Difference is simply huge. This is the proportion of 11-year-olds who bullied others uh, two or more times each month. And uh, it goes from about 2 or 3% at the bottom there up to well over 20%. So really big differences in the frequency of bullying. And that, in a sense, is what inequality is about. One of the great surprises, uh, at least for me, but I think many others working on health inequalities uh, over the decades, was to recognize that social status wasn't simply important because of the material differences in living conditions, uh, but it had a direct, social status has direct effects on health and also to see that friendship is highly protective of health. 
But it was very much a surprise to, to researchers all over the world working on these issues. And of course, social status and friendship are in a way two opposite ways we can come together. You know, either uh, uh, in terms of dominance hierarchies and pecking orders based on power, on coercion, on privileged access to resources, regardless of other people's needs, or friendship which, which is based on a recognition of each other's needs. You know, in almost any animal species, there's awful potential for conflict because members of the same species have the same needs. And do we fight over everything or do we share? Do we recognize each other's needs? And so I think that uh, the quality of social relationships has been something that has always been fundamental to human well being and something we've become very sensitive to. So actually, the number of friends you have, whether you're integrated with other people, whether you're uh, involved in community life and so on, uh, those kinds of issues to do with the quality of your relationships, uh, good relationships are as protective um, as, uh, well, not having relationships, not having friends is as damaging as uh, smoking uh, to your survival over a follow-up period and really important issues around both these issues, both about different qualities of social relationships. And actually, these things are built into the language. Words like uh, companion uh, are based on uh, sharing, sharing of necessities, sharing bread. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, even in the communion service, the symbolic religious forms of these is, is still there. And of course, we eat together uh, because that's about sharing necessities. The symbolism goes very deep into our society and relationships. Um, and uh, this American anthropologist who spent his career studying hunting and gathering societies, which uh, were very predominantly uh, highly egalitarian, based on food sharing, uh, sharing and gift exchange. He said this, <coughs> gifts make friends and friends make gifts because the gift is the symbol that I recognize your need. I'm not going to fight you over access. And the sense of indebtedness that maybe makes you reciprocate that gift, he suggested, is uh, a social compact, the basis of a social compact between people. And you know, often people studying non-human primates talk about touch as the social cement um, in uh, groups of animals. And of course, touch has an important meaning between us as human beings. Um, you know, we convey emotional support and so on with a touch. Um, but amongst human beings, so much even more important are these little kindnesses we do for each other. Uh, the give and take, the reciprocity and so on in human relationships. And actually, we have developed so we can, we know how to play the, if you like, the egalitarian uh, social relationships, um, friendship. We know how to build and sustain those relationships. But we can also play the game to do with dominance and subordination and being better than other people, or on the other hand, feeling worse than other people, feeling looked down on, we react to that. Um, and so I think what we're dealing with is those kinds of feelings and which kind of social strategy predominates in our society. We use both of them all the time in our everyday lives, but in more unequal societies, we learn to use the one to do with dominance more. Um, life becomes a more matter of competition between us. And uh, I think just to uh, my last major point about this is really evidence that shows what's going on in terms of human relationships. There are lots of studies now which show that uh, involvement in community life, social cohesion, civic participation deteriorates in more unequal societies. Um, 
you can also see that uh, people trust each other less in more unequal societies. They're less likely to agree that most people can be trusted. Very big differences going from 15 or 20 percent of the population feeling they can trust others up to 60 or 65 percent feeling that. People are less helpful to each other, less willing to help uh, the disabled or the elderly. And of course you get these huge increases in violence, very well researched now. These red dots are American states, blue triangles are Canadian provinces. Uh, homicide rates going from about 15 per million population up to 150. Huge differences in violence. So you lose the, the community life, the reciprocity and so on. Uh, you grow up with a tr lack of trust um, and violence increases. And then if you look at really unequal societies, much more unequal than the ones we've been uh, showing you data on, places like Mexico, uh, you find people are frightened of each other. Their windows have got bars on their doors and so on, around their yards, razor wire on top, uh, house after house like that. And in South Africa, just the same thing. Uh, the wires on the top, of course, an electric fence, and this notice says armed response, so you may get shot if you're caught flying in. So think about that transformation of human relationships. And remember also the research on the determinants of happiness, uh, quality of life, uh, the influences, really profound influences on health, point to the quality of social relationships as being crucial. Happiness is about the social environment, the quality of our relationships. And so inequality is doing the damage right at the heart of that. And actually, the, what I've just told you, the, that pattern of declining, deteriorating human relationships is shown also by quite different data. This is showing that in more unequal societies, uh, countries involve more of their labour force in what they call guard labour, security staff, prison officers, police. More people are needed to protect ourselves from each other in more unequal societies. So it's that same, just the same thing as the last few slides I've shown you. So what can we do about it? You can reduce income differences before tax or redistribute uh, through taxes and benefits. We have to use both strategies. Uh, the main reason actually why income differences have grown so much uh, over the last generation is that uh, income differences before tax have increased so much, but also top tax rates have been lowered dramatically. Um, I think that if we rely too much on redistribution through taxes and benefits, um, those are so easy to undo. If you make some progress there, another government coming in can undo it all so easily. I think that our long-term strategy uh, has to be um, to increase all forms of economic, what we call economic democracy. And as our forms of political democracy seem increasingly meaningless, I think we have to extend democracy into economic life, into the workplace, into business, uh, by having employee representatives on company boards, not just token representative representation, but hopefully uh, a representation that increases its, its uh, share of uh, seats on the board over time. Um, but also more incentives to uh, cooperatives uh, and uh, employee-owned companies. Um, I think all those things are, are really important and embed greater equality more fundamentally in our society. Um, so perhaps that's the long-term um, solution to these problems. And interestingly, the evaluations of more democratic companies suggest that they do better. Both uh, nicer employers, um, nicer companies to work for, and they tend to have higher productivity. Fairly reliable evidence from many different studies that actually greater economic democracy is beneficial socially 
and economically. So thank you. <laughs> Much, Kate and Richard. So we've got uh, a lengthy time period now for questions and answers. We're just going to get ourselves sorted out with seats and microphones and things like that. Do you want to take this one as the room? In 30 minutes. And, um, well, actually, I'm going to give you my so I'm holding this one for your roving bit, but you can share the roving bit. No, I don't need one. We'll see how we can. We can probably share this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so thanks. Gail's going to go around with a roving mic. Um, and would anyone like to start the ball rolling? I mean, there's a fantastic talk uh, with much to provoke thought and concern and even some potential solutions. Thank so you. if you would like, I, I personally like to hear who people are. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm um, nice. Mariana. Um, I'm involved in our local community in North Edinburgh, and various gardens and community centres. Um, but I was going to ask you a question about the role of media in, how can I put it, not promoting inequality, but making it seem so much greater. We, we've heard about what the media has been doing with news or fake news, but this is more to do with celebrities and sports people and so on who seem to earn amazing sums of money. Even in the BBC, you know, <laughs> talking about a million or something in contracts for the top people. So this is all becoming very public and people like us who maybe worked away all our lives and kind of professional job kind of look at it in amazement and feel, hmm, we'll never earn that, never did earn that. Our children will never earn that. It's in Hello Magazine and uh, other things like that. Do you think that the media has part of the blame for people feeling that their inequality in countries where most people are sort of just managing at least, if it's not comfortable, has a lot to... Um, for that? I think that uh, actually it's much more much better that people know about these inequalities because I think we suffer the social consequences in terms of vaguely perceived class differences, feelings of superiority and inferiority when people don't know the income differences. Uh, when we do, after the um, financial crash, you know, the anger, the discovery that the people at the top were earning so much. I think that is a, 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 the beginnings of awakening um, to the real causes of these things. You know, it is the material differences between us that give rise to bigger social distances uh, and so build those feelings of, of superiority and inferiority. Um, I think I think the media exacerbate both the upward looking stuff around around celebrity but also the downward facing prejudices yes. and and the way that the media write about those who are poor those who are unable to work for various reasons you know the language that is used the way in which we are invited to sneer at them and look down upon them i think is 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 heinous really and I mean, you, you meet people all the time who will talk about sink estates where whole families haven't worked for generations, you know. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation wanted to study those families and they couldn't find any. You know, I mean, they tried really, really hard. And so the media does exacerbate um, inequalities, I think, in, in how they are presented to us. Um, I'm sure somebody will ask at some point about social media tonight, as well, it's very, it's very hard to know how to approach those things other than by as well as trying to extend democracy into our economic institutions, we do need to extend it somehow into our media. Um, we've been impressed, haven't we, by Scandinavian countries where um, trade unions are 
publishers of newspapers. Um, and actually, if you can get a readership above a certain amount, then you can get some government funding for your newspaper or, or, or news dissemination efforts. Whereas we have a press that that's dominated by very, very few vested very interests. Seen. Vested interests. So, I mean, you raised the point of social media, and that's the obvious follow-up question. So, it's striking the data showing the associations between various measures of inequality and childhood stress and distress and mental illness. But one of the common factors that people uh, suggest is associated with that is, is social media usage in particular. So do those factors interact or are they independent? This inequalities and social media usage, because uh, they're both... Actually, people tend to blame social media these days, particularly in youth. I suspect that we'd use social media quite differently if we were in a much more equal society. And it's actually something that could be studied. I'd like to see a PhD on it or something. But uh, uh, I showed you the graph of bullying, much more common in more unequal societies. And of course, a lot of why we blame the social media is it's used partly for bullying amongst kids. Mm -hmm and you get kids being suicidal and so on. So I think the way we use these new forms of communication is affected by the culture of inequality. And, and I do, as I always say, when we talk about this, want to um, draw attention to the fact that for some people, actually, social media is a lifeline. It is um, a way of connecting to a community, of having relationships with people, um, for, so for some people, it's, it's a very, very positive part of, of their social support, their networks, their friendships. Um, it's just that it is a tool that in a more unequal, um, competitive, celebrity and appearance-oriented society can be used in, in, in very negative ways. We've got a lady here, a lady at the front, uh, uh, gentleman, third row, so... I used to work in mental health. I'm very deaf, so okay. speak loudly. So uh, I work in mental health. I changed just very recently. And um, what I came across, for example, is that at some point I had a discussion with the manager and I asked him, um, do you think that people, if they feel insecure in their work, are cohorts? And he said yes. And I, at the time I was very shocked by this uh, answer <laughs> because many people who want to work in mental health are very young, 21, and they would actually believe that they are covers if, if they don't stay at work who feels for them insecure. And in mental health you have a lot of insecure work. And then the other thing which I came across is that um, as soon as you try to build strong teams, as you said, friendships are important or Kind of trust with new colleagues. The immediate response from management was they had to dismantle this team because these people know too much. <laughs> and, and this was very depressing. You know, this is not one occasion, this happens like 10 times during, ten, during two and a half years. So, what, what would you think about this kind of mentality and thinking and not actually having? Any intention to improve work and uh, relationship between people? It's for in working in institutions. Mm. Um, we were having a little trouble hearing every every word you said. My well, hearing I, is very bad. <clears throat> but I think your question is really about, you know, why is it that within some settings, where you know whether those are. Um, private or public services, but but institutions, you know, where where people come together and, and work together. Why is it that some people are not interested in fostering a more egalitarian or more sharing and reciprocal way of working, um, and insist upon upon hierarchy and divisiveness? Is that that what you're asking about? I suspect that the people at the top really start to view themselves as infinitely more capable than most of the population. Uh, and actually, if you think of uh, companies like most of the multinationals where pay, differenti pay differentials 
a sort of one to 300. The CEO gets 300 times as much as somebody at the bottom. And paying someone one third of 1% of what you pay yourself, there's no more powerful way of saying you people are useless. And actually people judge themselves, people at the bottom feel that they're at the bottom because they're no good. Uh, and the people at the top have these very inflated ideas of themselves. Um, and I th it's interesting that, uh, you know, if you talk to people, we've talked to a few very rich people who've been sort of marginally interested in our, our work, and it's quite clear that they think they're paid by results. And yet one of the graphs I, I have uh, shows quite different, quite clearly that people at the top uh, which is it? It's uh, that one. It's that one. Uh, this shows shareholder returns uh, in companies where the CEOs at the top are paid less than the average in the big companies. So the top line, higher shareholder returns in the companies where the CEOs are paid less than the ones where they're paid the most, which is the lower shareholder returns, the red line there. Um, and so, actually, these people at the top are not justifying their, you know, their wages are not justified in terms of productivity. Um, and I, I think that uh, there's a vicious circle. The bigger the pay difference is, the more you think there are differences in, in people's abilities and self-worth. That's true. Yes. Any other Thank you very much. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I have about 100 questions, but I'll only do one. And uh, one of the things I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in in my day job, I work as head of open government in um, government. And um, the issue of trust um, is we've seen whether you're looking at uh, the Enderman uh, or Civicus or whatever they, the measure of trust is. We've seen trust in the press, we've seen trust in uh, NGOs recently, and trust in governments and institutions all going absolutely downwards. Um, have you any sense that that's related to um, inequality? And that is it more likely to be, um, uh, it, it seems to me, uh, as I look at it, that the more unequal the society, that the more divided it becomes and the less people trust. And, and one of the manifestations of that is, is what we've just heard about um, trust in information. So trust in the press, trust in uh, government institutions, trust in um, the fact we no longer value um, uh, experts. That kind of language just seems uh, designed to, to um, undermine trust. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, yeah, can stop, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that the decline in trust, uh, as you said, very generally, not only uh, trust in other people, but trust in institutions, in politicians and so on, uh, I suspect, I and mean, they do move together, and I think it's uh, part of the same um, basic phenomenon, that it's a sense that everyone is more out for themselves. You know, the big rises in, in inequality, the big step change in inequality in Britain came in the 1980s under Thatcher. We moved to a new level of inequality and we've been up on a different, uh, a sort of new plateau since then. No such uh, thing as society. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, and I think we've become a more antisocial society in lots of different ways. But this is, it's fairly well established that uh, and the causal ordering is also well established that uh, the changes in inequality precede the changes in trust. I think it takes us to a really dangerous place, though, doesn't it? I mean, the, the data are really clear about, about the links. But I think when you, when you lose that trust, not only do you see decline in sort of civic participation that, that, that Richard showed, but I think actually you create populations that are very, very vulnerable and they're vulnerable to populism and they're vulnerable to extremism because if if people are told repeatedly that nobody can be trusted, um, that experts can't be trusted, that politicians can't be trusted, um, I, th I think it leaves them in a very vulnerable position. Richard showed a picture of Mexico 
Yeah, and when we were in Mexico, um, well, every year we get to visit different countries and I always put travel guides to the countries we're going to in Richard's stocking, don't I? (laughs) <laughs> every Christmas and so I, I, and then I read them and, and tell him what, where we're going and what, what was going on and um, I put one for Mexico didn't I in, in, yeah. in your stocking and on, when I read it I was really shocked it said if you have if you're in Mexico and you have a traffic accident or any kind of incident or something somebody steals something do not go to the police you know, do not go to the police it's not worth it it'll, you know it'll, it'll be worse than if you didn't go um and we still, in this country, we, we still got the rule of law. We're still hanging on to lots of our democratic institutions, but we're teetering, I feel. Um, and Michael Gove once sat in a radio interview with you and said, Richard is right, um, before then kind of going around him and, and saying the exact opposite, which showed he thought he was wrong. <laughs> Um, and then, and then, you know, a couple of years later, he's saying we mustn't. You know, the British public are fed up with experts. Um, I, I, I do worry very much, and I don't think any of us have figured out how how to deal with that. How to how do you deal with with teaching people to discriminate the truth from real fake news when they're being told that black is white and white is black? Mm-hmm. I, I... I've got to interject before your question. Sorry, but I, I find that really difficult to understand. You've showed us data where the more unequal the state, the more likely they were to vote for Trump, I think. And we, back in the 80s, we had this really weird phenomenon in the, uh, where the people who bought and read the scum would vote for Thatcher. It was just, I don't I really understand that. Do you have a handle on why that would be? Well, I mean, the, the very rude response. most disadvantaged. Yeah. Are voting Turkey's voting for Christmas is what yeah. it's, it's usually Why? described as. Well, it, it, I think people people who when when large groups of the population feel left behind and abandoned, then I think they are quite open to strong messages. Um, mm. And it's perhaps more typical of extreme groups that they're willing to give a strong message, even if it's not true, more willing to to tell people what they think they want to hear, even if they've got no intention of following through. But I don't know. And I think the sort of dislike of political correctness that was people felt was, uh, in a sense, uh, repressing, uh, stopping people for, from talking about what they felt were important problems, whether things around immigration or race or, or whatever. Um, it was perceived as a sort of class control by an elite, an elite that perhaps they didn't differentiate much whether they were um, con- conservative or Labour. And I think that breaking through that were people like Trump, who, because they didn't have that political correctness, were seen as, uh, uh, and also Farage, of course, um, seen as if they were poor boys made good. There was a sense of class identification and Farage's um, liking for beer and being photographed endlessly outside pubs and so on, the common man, uh, and Trump too, uh, playing a similar game. And so although they were uh, enormously wealthy, they were seen almost as if they were one of us made good. Um, as opposed to part of this elite who uh, won't recognise the truth in all sorts of ways. I think that was there was a yeah. process of class identification. False, but it went on. Thank you. Sorry to keep this away for so long. And we've got two more up here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've read a couple of economists debating recently in the context of a programme dedicated to the future of betterment of humanity. Right? It's explicitly a programme that looks at rational analysis of short-term and long-term betterment of the human mind. And both of these economists seem to be confidently in agreement that it's far more important that we aim for more growth, that we aim to increase equality or to tackle inequality. Could you agree that argument? You can have first go at this. <laughs> I mean, that, that is mainstream economic thinking, has been for, for a long time and, and still is. 
there are economists who think differently. Um, and there are certainly well worked out ideas about whether we need steady state economies versus growth economies, whether we actually need degrowth economies. But for anybody who's thinking about planetary boundaries and whether or not we can continue to just grow and grow and grow at the rate we're growing, um, anybody looking at that can see that we can't and that the pursuit of growth is going to bump up against those planetary boundaries and get in the way of us creating sustainable economies that can cope with climate change and all, all of the damage that it brings. Um, there's a huge movement across the world that you might call a kind of post-GDP movement um, of economists and others, policymakers, campaigning groups, calling for societies to focus on the creation of well-being rather than economic growth and thinking about the ways to get there. Um, we have a representative at the front from Wellbeing, Alliance, Wellbeing Economies Alliance Scotland. Um, if you look up Wellbeing Economies Alliance online, you'll, you'll find a, a growing movement. Um, <laughs> but I still, I, I think the tide is turning. I think there are prominent economists, big movements, all calling for things to be different. But they are trying to turn the Titanic before it hits the iceberg, you know, and that there's a lot of inertia and there's a lot of mainstream economic thinking to overcome. We were talking earlier about um, how students across the world are calling for their, economic students are calling for their curricula to be revised because they feel they're not being taught the appropriate things about what you do post-global financial crisis with imminent climate change. But I think absolutely key is the fact that in although economic growth is important to increasing well-being in poorer countries, in the rich countries that is no longer true. Uh, even if you look at changes in average incomes over 40 years or something, there is no longer a relationship with changes in life expectancy. Our life expectancy, well, in Britain, it's no longer going up as fast as before, but um, in most countries, it goes on increasing over time, regardless of whether you've got fast or slow economic growth. The same is true of all sorts of measures of well-being. Uh, they've just parted company. And of course, we all want go on wanting more income because we hope with more income, we can improve our position and status within society. But in status competition, it's a zero-sum game. We can't all improve our status over each other. Um, one person's gain is another person's loss. So we've got five, six people uh, in the queue for questions. The lady um, in the... I'm all interested. I've never met them. I've actually worked in Manchester. I mean, it's probably taken to the global stage. And this is the city that had late make poverty history probably decades ago now. Because... Um, Looking at it as a global context, what I'm reading from the stats that you've shown us is that in reality, the West, such as it still is, is having, would really have to indeed, um, as you're saying, be a turkey and vote for Christmas because the issues that are much more global around whether it's migration and so on is a fundamental issue of the institution of wealth, which um, in, in many ways, I guess, we've heard in different, set in different ways over different decades. But how does your narrative, I guess, play to, I guess, the United Nations and so on, yeah. where we can see this as far as it works, not, not better at all? I think um, for rich, developed nations to move towards um, economies that focus on creating well being, degrowth or steady state economies, and doing what they need to do to address climate change isn't Turkey's focusing for Christmas because actually they can do that and as Richard just said still achieve high levels of well-being high quality of life so I think it's a win-win for rich developed countries if they choose to follow that path they will be both contributing to a better planet but they will also be creating more well-being for their people at the same time I mean, we've now got an international framework with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for 2030 that applies to both rich and poor countries. 
And if countries pursued them energetically, they would go a long way towards um, creating fairer, more sustainable societies with higher quality of life for most people. Um, the risk, I think, is that they are too much seen by rich developed countries as something for poorer countries, something for middle income countries, not so much for them. There's a big commission working at the moment in the EU that is trying to make sure that the EU becomes more about sustainable equality than it does about um, security and growth. And that's all happening just as we're about to leave, um, which is a bit depressing. But I, I think absolutely crucial um, thing coming out of our work in, in a sense is that uh, it's no longer GNP per capita that improves well-being, but we can improve well-being dramatically by improving the quality of the social environment, social relationships between us, and the policy handle is reducing inequalities. Okay, so the gentleman at the back, then two ladies in the front, then you. Uh, yes, I, I'm uh, Mike Brown, I'm, I'm retired. Um, I think the, the kind of, uh, it's not that the elephant in the room, but we're talking about how the economy is structured, which is really at the basis of the, the facts that you, you presented uh, today and your arguments. And um, it is quite clear for, with um, certainly with global warming that, that we, we do need to move to, to a steady state type of economics. But, but the, the, the economic system which, which we're all part of um, is actually based on, on the increasing of profits, you know, so it's capitalism. So it, it's quite, it, it, it won't be an easy task to, to um, move to something which actually meets human needs and doesn't have the all the awful consequences of it, which you're is, well, is both of it. And um, I suppose I'm, I'm still a bit unclear as to, to how we get to a situation where, where we can uh, save the world in terms of global warming and create kind of societies which were there, were there with quite a lot of faults and, and problems in, in the immediate post-war period for about 25 to 30 years. And while it's, it's easy for us in the UK to blame the demise of that in the UK on Thatcher or fascism, um, the same process went through all the uh, countries at, at various times over that period of the 1970s to 1980s. And the, the reason was, was because the, the, uh, the, there was a crisis really of, of profitability in the capitalist economy. And the way that that was uh, sorted out was to diminish the strength of, of working people through, through those national uh, political and um, you know, you know, very well organized <coughs> on working people, which we saw in, in the line strike. So, um, you know, it's these kind of politics which, which, which we need to, to sort of somehow engage with again. Um, it, it, however difficult that is. Yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be short term. Um, I think there are various things that make me optimistic that it can be done. One is that, you know, we did used to be much more equal um, for various political reasons. And the reason we are less equal now is also due to politics. Politics can change things and politics can itself change. I also think that we've seen huge social progress over the last half a century or so on all kinds of fronts around the rights of women, ethnic minorities, um, all, all kinds of different human, human rights. And generally, those shifts have come about not because politicians decided to grant those rights to people, but because we, um, as communities, as grassroots organizers, as campaigners, demanded that change. So I do think we need social movements to push for change. And I do think we need um, a transformation of capitalism. But I also think that that's possible. And I think that things like the past global financial crisis and the one that everybody says is coming and the challenges of climate change will perhaps force us to make more radical changes over a shorter time than we might 
think are possible. But I, I, I'm not thinking it's going to be easy or that those vested interests aren't, aren't solidly against us. It might be just be worth pointing out some of the trends in the past. Uh, this is inequality in different countries from, uh, what, 1930? Uh, uh, some, sometime in the 1930s, inequality declined rapidly uh, until the late 1970s and then the modern rise of inequality. Uh, I think that is very substantially the rise and fall of the labour movement, uh, the power of social democratic parties, the fear of communism, uh, the sort of power of the countervailing voice that there's another way that societies can work. And, you know, if uh, what Katie said is, is right, that as many people are fearing that there will be another financial crash, it may be that turning points come out of uh, crises. Um, in the 1930s, Roosevelt's New Deal is said to have been based on a, a feeling that you had to reform the system. Indeed, he said you had to reform it in order to preserve it. Uh, and the, the range of riots and wildcat strikes and so on going on then, which made people feel that the system was threatened. Um, and of course, that's what changed the poll tax. So it, it's, I, I do wonder whether uh, uh, these kind of pressures build up and follow crises. Okay, we're getting near, perilously close to half six. I'm going to ask some quick questions and quick responses for the last four or five, if I may. <laughs> right. I'm sorry that the discussion quite so fast. Um, Sarah, it's one of the questions I, I had in my mind, obviously, you have a sense addressed already, which was to be how do you deal with your own frustration when you have such a, a profoundly convincing analysis and you've been banging away about it apparently successfully for so many years and yet things are getting steadily worse. And in a sense you've addressed that, but perhaps within that if I could just ask a particular question about the issue of mental health in young people. We see time and again reports about this on television news, in newspapers, in discussion, in social media. Um, and yet there is very little attention given in those discussions to the causes of it. There's a lot of discussion about the inadequacy of mental health services and the financial need for more investment in those, which of course cannot be denied. And yet I see very little about the causal analysis which you are controlled. Um, a quick a quick response. I mean, I think these things take time. I think the attention that's being paid currently to the crisis in mental health in this country, and particularly for young people, is quite new. You know, the ideas that we have parity um, around um, services and provision for mental health and, and physical health, that's quite new. There's still a lot of stigma around mental health issues. Um, I think we I think we will see change. We we are really pleased that we've been invited to give a keynote at the British Psychological Society's annual conference early in 2019, and I think that represents a shift um, in a profession that historically has been focused on individual causes of things rather than societal causes of things. So I think these things just take a bit of time. Recently, we were invited to speak at the Treasury as well, which is, <laughs> I was about to say, a step forward, but maybe a step back. Step backward. <laughs> um, how do we deal with our own frustration? I don't know. I think we used to naively think that all we had to do was get the evidence out there and then somebody would do something about it. Um, but I, I, I think we see enough positive signs and, and green shoots for, for optimism. I but, do think the tide yeah. is turning. About young people, I mean, I do think that there's a sort of crisis of a, about a sense of self-worth um, uh, <coughs> triggered by that feeling that people have enormously different values. Um, and uh, that makes social comparisons uh, more painful, if you like, more loaded. Um, and I, I rather, s I can't help expecting sometime, instead of people using Facebook and so on to dress themselves up, to look as if they're having a wonderful life, sometime, instead of 
these anxieties being a sort of private um, psychological weakness we have uh, that we try and hide away from other people, we'll start to see that it, actually it's something that we all share. It's part of our common humanity. Uh, and people might start using Facebook to tell the truth about their lives. Um, the, the contrast in the two pictures that Kate uh, showed, the two photos, the posed smiley faces and the picture taken when people are unaware. Uh, you know, at some point we might break through that self-presentation, uh, the contrast with the reality. Um, and instead of it being so divisive, it'll be part of uh, a problem we all share in a way that I think feminism did at one stage. You know, I think that uh, women's torment with their lives was perceived way back um, as a sort of <laughs> private weakness. There's something wrong with me. Uh, and yet uh, feminism started to s explain these 